to the chair Dread comes knocking and The cancer diagnosis in general as a global statement would be that it was a wake-up call to life. It was a wake-up call about how I wanted to live my life. And I asked myself that question, am I living the life I want to live? And the answer was no. Come October, I, I found a lump in my breast and up high in my chest. And um, I knew it wasn't right. I knew it was something different. So I went to the doctor and didn't tell anybody about it because I figured eh, if it's nothing, then it'll be nothing. But it wasn't nothing. Because I had gone through all of this with my mom, I knew her doctors, I knew the hospitals, I knew the way to get there, I knew the drugs that she took, I knew the, the, the treatments I tried to give her to, to try to relieve some of the side effects of chemotherapy and radiation. And, and all of a sudden, I was in the exact same place. So I went to the house that we had bought in North Carolina and I went to my mother's doctors and I went to, and sat in those same chairs it gives me goosebumps even today to think about it and the smells and the sounds and it was horrifying to be back into those places with me now sitting on the other side and I realized um, as compassionate as I tried to be with her I had no idea what she was going through and until I went through it myself um, I had no idea another year blue So I went to uh, Duke University Hospital to get scanned and find out what was going on and I knew it wasn't good. And I had metastatic advanced breast cancer in my bones, in my spine, in my hips, in a lymph node in my chest. And uh, here we go again. So I, I received high dose chemotherapy with a stem cell rescue. Some people call it a bone marrow transplant. I was going through some heavy chemotherapy because some breast cancers, especially in younger women, are very resistant to the chemotherapy drugs. So they wanted to make sure that these particular lesions and this particular cancer cells would respond to conventional treatment because higher doses of conventional treatment wouldn't be any better. They would just make me really unwell. So I came down here, I was pretty weak and ball headed and I burnt my head, you know, blisters on my head from being on the beach. But Charlie and I spent a week in, in the little cottage getting ready to um, submit to this program. I, I came home from Duke and it was after my first year checkup and I had all the CAT scans, chest x-rays, blood work, you know, everything that they can look at and it was clean and I went home and I sat on the back porch and I just knew that what I wanted was to fall in love again and to have my whole life be about music and I met Lou about six weeks later and my whole life is about music and I'm in love. I'd rather love you five minutes The way the song Five Minutes came about, I guess it happened years ago when Marcy was, uh, we were sitting on the couch and Marcy was telling me that, uh, that, that she wanted to, to give me an option to, uh, to find some, to keep searching for somebody else, you know, um, uh, because uh, she wasn't sure how long she was going to be on the planet. And, uh, you know, but nobody knows those sort of things. And I told her that I, I'd rather love her five minutes than, um, than never, you know, than, than not, never have that opportunity. I've had two surgeries. The first one was to remove my left breast where the original cancer was. And then I, after I was genetically tested and I found out that I had BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene mutations, that gave me the information I needed to then have the other breast removed and a total hysterectomy. And I did that all at the same time. And my other sister, who, was, who has BRCA2, 
we had our surgeries together at Duke. So she had her hysterectomy and I had my surgeries. We had a little party. I think it was the moment when I first saw my chest. You know, cancer is, the experience of cancer has so much loss in it. And I lost my role in my community. I lost the role in my family. Uh, I lost my freedom. I lost my health. I lost the sense that I was going to grow old and, and you know, have gray hair and be an old person. And I lost parts of my body. And so when I first saw my chest, having lost one breast, um, I was surprised. It was just kind of like, oh, it's okay. It's okay. And when I realized it was okay, I wanted everybody to know it was okay, or that it can be okay, that you can find a way inside of the loss of a body part or, or whatever that it's okay, and it was okay for me to learn how to ask for help, where I was always the helper and the caregiver. I needed help and I needed care. I'm self-conscious about it a lot, you know, no, there's no denying that, but most of the time I forget about it. And then when I do get self-conscious, I do remember that, that I look very athletic. So people have asked me, you know, are you a marathon runner? And I say, yes. <laughs> because <laughs> I ran a marathon and uh, then one day um, on this very stage I stepped off the stage and this woman she said oh honey you are the sexiest flat-chested woman I've ever seen and I said thank you <laughs> and then I told her why so for me cosmetic surgery was having the other breast removed because then I was even it was more difficult being uneven than, than just being flat. And I know I always have the choice. My surgeon gave me the, the greatest gift. He said, give yourself a few years. Get, out, get rid of the cancer first. Let's just focus on the thing that's really important right now. And he said, you know, not that your breast is not important, but let's just focus on getting you well. And then you can always have reconstructive surgery later when you're done. And I would never have thought about that if he hadn't have suggested it. I thought, you got to do it all at once. I have to wake up and be complete and have that. And what I've come to understand is that even if I did have an implant or if I had any other kind of procedure that would give me a form of a breast, it was never going to be my breast. And sometimes little girls will come up to me and they'll say, what happened? And little babies will. And the way I hold it and the way I explain it is I say that um, my left breast got sick and me and the doctors decided to take it away so that the rest of me wouldn't get sick. This little girl one time asked me when I was in a bathing suit, and I told her that. She said, oh. And she turned around to go jump in the pool, and she stopped and turned around and came back, and she said, does that happen to all girls? And I said, no, honey, no. And she said, oh, okay, you know. And I'd like to say, I would, if she was older, I would have said, just the lucky ones. I want them to take away some tools mm -hmm. that will help them through the same journey or a similar journey of life-threatening illness. A sense that they have everything that they need right inside of them. They don't have to look anywhere outside. Mm -hmm. that, um, that they are their own universe, that they can be their own comfort, that they have their tools, that they have their heart and that um, they, have, they have a choice about happiness and where their attention is and how their life is going to be and just another way to look at something that for many and in the media and out in the world that it's so devastating. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be so devastating. Dead girl walking on a lonesome road headed to the chair Dread comes knocking, wrecking my brain.